beauty of this community, um, the Hamish kite, the fact that the that the emphasis over here is not on Gashmis, it's on Ruchmis, and, um, and and the fact that they have such a, a beautiful, beautiful uh, social fever over here. So on behalf of my daughter-in-law and my son, uh, Rabbi David Nissel, who's a, who's a, who's a Zoha to be a teacher in, in Hollywood in the high school there, thank you so much for making them feel at home. So let's get to work over here. Um, I want to begin with just a story, just an introductory story. There's a mitzvah, there's a mitzvah that when something extraordinary happens to you, so you have to give thanks to Kush Baruch I was packing, those of you who know my personality, so I was packing at the last minute, um, knowing that the, that the Nesher was picking me up in an hour, I was busy packing away, and then suddenly I realized that because of, oh by the way, what do we call it over here? Are we pompous, do we call it COVID-19, or can I just, this is like South Florida, I say Corona, da, 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 da. what do we say here? What do you call it? Corona. Okay, Corona, I prefer Corona, it just sounds such more fun. Um, I go to Corona party, like the whole thing is so, yeah, so um, Corona literally has made time stand still. That's what I feel very, very much. And I forgot that I have not renewed my Esther. I'm British. To come to America, every two years you have to uh, renew your visa. <clears throat> and I forgot to do it. And it was basically, uh, I think it was four hours away from when my plane's supposed to leave. And I'm packing. And I, I ran to go online. And it says, um, you will get your visa within 72 hours. Which means that I'm not going to get on that plane, which means I'm not supposed to be here right now. So besides the fact that my, my wife was devastated, uh, because especially all the candies that I bought for the grandchildren and everything, I was just saying that, Kush ah, this is ridiculous. I'm coming to teach Terry, you better help me out. It did say that if you're lucky, you can get it in three hours, but normally it takes 72 hours to get your visa. I took the taxi, I went there, they said you're not getting on the plane because uh, we're closing the flight in one hour and uh, one hour is less than the three hours that they've said it's going to be. So I went to the side, I called up my wife and I said, Debbie, I can't do this, only you can do this. There's something very powerful about your Tehillim. I'm going to put the phone up and ask her to say Tehillim. She said to Helen, Ashley said to Helen, I went back to the front desk. I said, could you please check your internet? Did my ex to come through? And they looked and they said, it's a miracle. It said, as we're speaking, it's coming through. Mm -hmm. Literally, within half an hour or so, they would not allow, allow me on the flight. And um, there's no question in my mind, some of you actually know my wife, um, Reverend St. Debbie Nissel, who works in Shoffman's. And uh, in the schuss of her to Helen, about me that I should be here. So I managed to get on that flight. I couldn't be happier. Um, so, I read this yesterday, and it triggered me. By the way, triggered is my new word. I learned it from my students. Every time you do something that upsets them, you say, Rabbi, I'm, I feel triggered. I don't know what it is. I used to get triggered by chocolate. I don't know what's going on in this world. But this thing over here, uh, yesterday I got this from a friend of mine. He wrote a short paragraph in the newspaper. I'm not going to mention his name because I'm going to be critical. He said, quote, it's Eric Pesach 5781, and the house is getting noisy. Who would have predicted this? Over 90% of us have already taken the corona vaccine, and most of us have long discarded our masks. What a relief. Baruch Hashem, President Trump's second term is off to a flying start, with six more Arab nations joining the peace accords, thanks to the Secretary of State, Kushner. <laughs> our simplest are overflowing, and our kids have never loved learning more. Stores on 13th Avenue, Route 59, and Central Avenue, do I have to translate this line to people? <laughs> uh, are packed again, and so are our beloved shuls. And to think, it all started four months ago in Kislev, the month of miracles. Things looked so bleak back then, but our retalkum never wavered, and our tzilas never faltered. We never stopped believing that Hashem's master plan would soon turn everything around. And sure enough, it did. Rackets, keep dreaming, you never know. <laughs> so I read this. And I was triggered. Okay, I just love using that word in the sentence. It makes me feel so hit. Okay, and I was triggered. And I just, I just, I'm telling you that this is something that really, really upsets me. Because basically what my dear friend is saying that um, we want the Hanukkah miracle to bring everything back to normal, right? To bring everything back to normal. So I just want to make a public service announcement 
Um, ladies and gentlemen, everyone listening out there, normal was never good. Just a quick reminder, before we had to wear these ridiculous masks, and before we had um, the fear of whatever it means, I don't understand American politics, but I do know that, uh, that for four years we had a friend, a good man, speaking from Yerushalayim, we had a friend in the White House, and we're very grateful, Akura Satov, but this whole thing about going back to the good days, and this is what we want, this is why we went through Corona, this is why Hashem is literally shaking the world upside down. Um, I don't understand American politics, but one thing I do know, if the last three weeks has taught us anything, is that Kosh Baruch Hu has these little strings, and at the bottom strings are these little puppets called the players in Washington. Kosh Baruch is so clearly moving everything around. And my definition of normal is what we'll be doubling for three times a day, Yishraim Erev Rav and Tashu, we don't want to go back to what was once normal because normal was never, never good. And here I want to add something very personal. I spend a lot of time talking to my students. I come to America, I'm supposed to talk to people. A lot of people in this audience over here, I've had a one-on-one -on -one Kesha with talking what's going on. And people go through two types of challenges, two types of Yisur. Um, one of them is what's called extraordinary, I don't know how to say, but something that is objectively hardship, um, borderline tragedies that people go through. Um, I spend a lot of time talking to all the singles. My definition of all the singles are the ones that cry to me that they're going to to their friends um, bar mitzvahs. Some maybe bar mitzvahs are already in their 30s and they're still single. And I listen to their pain. I'm not talking about the ones that are over here. They're like, oh my gosh, from wedding and so No, I'm talking about people go through real yisurim in that area. Um, people with shalom bias issues. People have difficulty raising their children. It's probably, at least in my lifetime, and what I heard from my parents, and what I understand, at least from the last few generations, it's never been harder and more challenging to raise good, healthy English children. And then, of course, sickness, um, mental sickness is skyrocketing. I don't believe people who say that, well, it's just coming out to the open. No, I have different classes which I'm not going to speak about now, about why, because of the way society is structured, it has a tr triggered mental abuse that's beyond belief. And um, what can I tell you? People are in a lot of pain. People are in a lot of pain. And people like us, I don't know who's here in front of me, but people like who are not in those categories, we have our own, going back to what I just read in the article, our own challenges in the world that is normal, just basically making ends meet. I, I, we had for lunch a couple, I'm not gonna say their names now, but um, I said to the, to, the, to, to the wife, who was a bus bias by us, I said, I'll never forget, your father's a top doctor here in, in, in South Florida, and he told me that 80%, he told me 80% of his income goes to tuition. Fear now we have a huge family. 80% goes to tuition. So people just assume, okay, you're a tough doctor, you must make a fortune. It doesn't work that way. People have financial struggles just to make ends meet. Uh, people have struggles in raising their children. I'm talking about when the children are not on the spectrum, don't have specific difficulties just to raise or Hashem, those of us that have a, a nice, loud, noisy family, just to be able to, 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 to manage and to survive. Uh, people have difficulties in making their marriages work. I'm not talking about when the husband is a bad person or is abusive or has to It's real, real problems. I'm talking about just personality differences, trying to make things work out. And as I mentioned, today it's considered normal and necessary that the, both the husband and the wife are working to just be able to make ends meet. There's a lot of pressures that are going on in this normal world without having to talk about what's happening in politics, what's happening in pandemics and the health things. Just life is very, 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 very stressful. And people have this feeling of, I don't know how I'm gonna do this. This feeling that I feel that is just too overwhelming for me. I, I, uh, I have to share with you, Last Shabbos, I had my grandchildren, and no, you're going to picture the scene over here. So, um, 
My wife likes to come into Shabbos with a clean kitchen. Is that understandable? You get the thing, as Shabbos comes in. So, one of my grandchildren, Yair, right? I don't know what it is. I can't, he's the cutest kid ever. He has like this, I mean, it's just this chocolate cake. I don't know who gave it to him. It was me, okay? But I gave it to him without really thinking it through. And he goes into the kitchen. He starts putting crumbs and everything like that. And I'm watching this whole scene unfold. Um, my wife has a mini panic attack, you know, what's going on over here? He's messing up the whole kitchen. And I'm thinking to myself, how awesome is this moment? Because for me, the most important thing about grandchildren is the concept of revenge. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but I, I just, I mean, Yara's mother, Ricky, okay, she should be well and healthy. When she was a little kid, I have vivid memories that she would climb into my bed at that moment of your deepest, deepest sleep. I don't know how they managed to figure out exactly at that moment when you were 90% dead. Okay, that's it, they get in a different world. And then she used to come into my bed, she didn't wake me up. She first used to like try and rip open my eyelids. Um, and then she would take a finger and then stuff it up my nostril. <laughs> and then afterwards, I would say, Ricky, what do you want? And she said, I threw up. Okay, <laughs> so that's it. So you walk out like a spare part from a zombie movie, and you find she did not just throw up, she timed the throw up. It has to be that to cause maximum damage. Okay, this is what we think you have to change the sheets and change everything, and that's it. And and uh, I'm the I'm the, when I my kids were that age, I was the one that took care of throw up. That was just my one of my jobs. And what can I tell you? Seeing my grandchildren doing this to their parents, it feels good. <laughs> <laughs> So, so, that's it, that's it, uh, you know, the, the special bonding that grandparents have with their grandchildren, it's so obvious, it's just, it's, it's the common enemy, I mean, this is how these things work. <laughs> but then to be, in a moment of honesty, I see how hard my, my daughter works, and, and you're all the same, I feel like my daughter has a full-time job, there's a husband that she's supporting, and Baruch Hashem is very good, and she has special needs kids, she has uh, Princess Khani, some of you uh, know, I had, uh, who I'm talking about, my special needs granddaughter. She's doing all these things. She's a super mom. It's, what she does is incredible. And it is very possible if she too has these moments when she feels completely and totally overwhelmed. Right? My definition of overwhelmed, the worst case scenario is when you feel your husband doesn't understand you. Could be your husband tries to understand you, and it's just a gender issue. I'm not gonna go down that route right now. I'm outnumbered. But sometimes, you know, I just, I just, my wife explains to me what's happening, and I just, ah, eh, male brain, don't get it. I just don't get it. So she, she's trying to talk to me, and, and I'm trying to sort of, yeah, I'm supposed to nod my head and say, wow, that must be so difficult. But I, she knows I don't really understand what she's saying. And sometimes you feel, okay, so my husband doesn't understand me. Sometimes a husband and wife are a great team, but they feel that they don't have support systems. The rabbi doesn't understand them, the parents, in-laws, brothers and sisters, people go through these moments where they feel tremendously overwhelmed, tremendously um, alone, and in a certain sense, they feel abandoned. And so they turn to Kurdish Baruch and they tell them, but nothing changes. Day in, day out, day in, day out, there's this deep existential feeling of being alone, of feeling, I don't know how I'm going to do this. You don't see a light at the end of the tunnel. It's not like, okay, if I can just make it through the end of this year, then everything's gonna fall into place. No, if anything, it's just gonna get harder and harder. And <coughs> my body is not always gonna be superwoman. And people don't understand me, and they just are trying to figure out their lives. And they're dominating to Kurdish Baruch Hu. They're waiting for that, uh, that moment when everything falls into place and they've been waiting weeks, months, sometimes years, and nothing changes, nothing happens. So, this is the normal that we need to break out of. This is the normal, this is the real normal. I really do believe that most people in this room know what I'm talking about. And sometimes the hardest thing about it is that you have no one that you can really, really talk this through. Talk this through. You can talk to people, they can give you empathy, they can give you love, and yeah, and they can give you, bake for you cookies, whatever it is. But at the end of the day, that aching feeling inside of you that I'm alone, trying to figure this out, trying to work these things out, nothing seems to be changing. 
Because Baruch Hu, you talk to him and it's a one-way conversation. This is something that I hear again and again, and I, I understand it, and yet, to be honest, I've also been there, I, Baruch Hashem, Baruch Hashem, I, I, overwhelmingly, it's been, it's been relatively easy for me, but I know those moments, I know what it means when, when you don't know how to express the ache, the pain that's going on inside of you, and you don't know where to direct it to. So I want to give a framework. I'm not going to be able to solve the problems, but I, I want to give a framework to be able to work through using the extraordinary presentations of Chazal to understand this time of the year. Just now, it was an hour ago, we did um, Kiddush HaKodesh, we did Greta Silvana, and I got in the Israel, and we, we couldn't dance because, because of the Corona, we couldn't dance, but we did like, you know, the Tending to dance to Eden Lo Iris, and we introduce the month of Kislev. I say to you, Kislev, what do you think? Hanukkah, correct? Yeah. Kislev equals Hanukkah, just like Nissan equals Pesach, Adar equals Purim, Shvat equals Tu Bishvat. So therefore, Kislev equals Hanukkah. Is that correct? Yeah. It's obviously not correct. It's obviously not correct. When does Hanukkah come on the 25th? It's literally the last gasp of the month. Not only that, Hanukkah is the only Yom that spills over into Tevez. If you gave me an extra hour, I could teach you that as well. We'd go through that whole thing. But Hanukkah really is the bridge between Kislev and Tevez. It's not a story of Kislev. People say that Kislev equals Hanukkah. That is a huge mistake as we're about to learn. So anyone that did have me as a student knows that I always talk about the months, and I always talk about the transition from month to month, and I always talk about the importance that Chazal give to remembering again and again and again. You need to be aware which month you're in because that teaches you what your Avodah is. Sometimes it's in your face, sometimes it's obvious, like I just mentioned at Pesach, and what we're supposed to be working on in the month of Nisan. The whole month of Nisan, is Pesach. There's the whole month of Nisan, there's no Tachnun, and um, Yachol and Rosh Chaydash. You might think you should talk about Kanyan of Egypt from Rosh Chodesh Nisan. Nisan is the March of Miracles, it's the month of freedom, so that we get. But what does it mean, the month of Cheshvan? What does it mean, the month of Kislev? I like to talk about borders because when I was a teenager, the first time that um, in high school, when I was taught that Jews believe that you travel through time as you travel through space, which means that this is totally unscientific. You have 12 months of the year, and you have to picture what it's like going through 12 European countries. And each time you switch from one country to the next, there's a border crossing, and that corresponds to changing from one month to the other. There's no question about it. If my name was Donald Trump, and I had to talk about going from America to Mexico, so that is without question the border crossing between Tishri and Cheshire. Let me just explain what just happened over here. Tishri is the month of love. What do you mean it's the month of love? It's the month when a Kushbarah says, I need the Daidi, the Daidi Li of El is now coming into fruition, Lemais, it's coming down to earth. Um, the encounter with God begins with Rosh Hashanah. Baruch Hu introduces himself as a king, but not just a regular king, a king that is loving and a king that wants to be there for us. And at that point then, we realize that we have 10 days to prepare for our marriage. Shlomo Lach taught us that Yom Kippur is Yom Chasen Nasar, Yom Sin Chaslibo, the day of Akadosh Baruch Hu's great marriage. Who's he marrying? Us. How do we prepare for it? 10 days of tshuva. What does tshuva mean? Tshuva means making ourselves into the bride, that we have no one else that we focus on except for the cost. If we get married, what happens after we get married? The Sheva brought us. So there's five days, there's five magical days between Yom Kippur and Sukkot where we prepare for the Sheva brought us, seven days we feast, then at the end of Sheva brought us, everyone go away and we just dance with the person we love. That's in Kostera. Um, the Hasidic Svarim especially speak magnificently of how the month ends up. And if I could begin using the imagery of the marriage, that would be the honeymoon. The honeymoon means it's just we're living in this blissful world. And at this point now, you can think to yourself, okay, 
I hit the jackpot, I've got the best husband, everything is perfect, everything is beautiful, everything is exactly the way it's supposed to be. And then boom, you hit Rishchidosh Cheshvan, and suddenly out of nowhere, you go from 100 to zero. Imagine you've got the perfect husband, everything went perfectly, and then suddenly he disappears. He disappears on you completely and totally, and you are abandoned by the person who presented to you a perfect situation, and suddenly there's nothing left anymore. Mar Cheshvan. There's no such thing as Mar Av. Because Av, Hashem does not abandon us. Av, the Kodesh Baruch Hu, sits on the floor and cries with us. I always give the marshal. If you have two choices, if you're a therapist, and you have two choices to work with a couple that are fighting or work with a couple that are no longer talking to each other. So everyone in real life knows that when there's fighting, there's toxic communication, but there's communication. When people are no longer talking, then the bridge becomes unfathomably long. And this is why it's called Mar Cheshvan. Cheshvan, Kodesh Baruch Hu, has disappeared. Hakol, Bakol, Mikol, Kol, he's gone. He's completely and totally gone. So you enter to this Cheshvan zone, and you learn about the month, and everything about the month is irredeemably negative. Just out of interest, is anyone in this room whose birthday was in Cheshvan? Okay, uh, okay, Revis and Basi. So, okay, I've probably picked on you so many times, it's like, it's you again. That's probably how you're feeling now. Why me? But uh, as, as you probably know, since you, 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 the, the centerpiece of this class, you have heard. So I know that uh, anyone, statistically, one in 12 people in this room are Cheshman babies. But um, my point is, is that you cannot leave this, this room until I get to the end, otherwise you will hate me because I'm about to give the simplistic view of Cheshvan as something extraordinarily weak. The month of Cheshvan is called the month of Scorpio. Scorpio is the, in Hebrew, the Akrav, right? The Akrav, Ayin, Kuf, Reish, base. Akrav is a scorpion, uh, which means that tonight, when you look outside and you connect the stars in the first 12th of the night, you will see Mazel Keshet, you will see the archer. A month ago, when you connect the stars, you will find Scorpio the Scorpion. Those of you that think, oh my gosh, do we believe in that stuff? Absolutely yes. We just don't turn into our bazaar. We, we understand that the Kuchavim, the stars, are the portals to the higher worlds. It's the way it's always been. This is Judaism 101. The stars are not the goal, the stars are the means to understanding what's beyond the stars. So the Kochavim, right, the Kochavim tell us what a Kosh Baruch wants in the higher level. And therefore, when you go from whatever it is, from Mazel, Nisan, Iyar, Sivan, and you go from Aries the Lamb to Taurus the Bull to Gemini the Twins, so you actually have to study what is going on behind the scenes to understand what we're supposed to be working on during that month. And Akra, a scorpion, has no redeeming features whatsoever. To quote my Rebbe Rabbi Shapiro, Kumaga in Akrab Misahu, which means, no offense, Basi, but every connection to you is instant death. <laughs> um, she's used to me, but just this is just the way it is. It's instant death. That you, you can have your pet snake. Down here, you probably have someone in this room that has a pet alligator. You just don't tell people about it, but it's a very, you know, South Florida thing to do. You have you can, you can have a relationship with your flower, with, with your alligator, with your snake, um, with all kinds of creatures, but not a scorpion. If you touch a scorpion, you're dead. There's no other way to connect. That's the way these things work. So, okay, that makes a lot of sense because it's the month of instant death. It's the month where Rish Baruch Hu, from having a maximum perfect relationship, has gone from 100 down to zero. What else do we know in the month? So, some of you may remember that each one of the 12 months comes with a letter. For those of you that don't know their basic Sefer Kuzari, I know this is Kabbalah, Sefer Yitzir talks about this, but the Kuzari, which you can buy double time in English, it's for sure in the library over here, there in Weimar Hay, he talks about this in great detail, and you get with you today, you get it with charts and everything is shown, how we get to the 12 letters of the 12 months. Just for those of you that have never heard these ideas before, Hashem created the world with letters. 
which means that before he created heaven and earth, the first thing he did was create 22 letters and he went in three steps. Step number one, in the beginning, God created Aleph, Mem, and Shem. Those are the first three letters that he created. Aleph is Avir, is Er, Mem is Mayim, and Shem is Esh. So what we call Ruach and Esh and Mayim were created through the means of these three letters, Aleph, Mem, and Shem. What came next? The seven letters. These are called, in the language of Chazal, the Kfuas. These are the seven letters that receive that dot in the middle of the letter. It's called, in Hebrew, Be Beis Gimondal, it's Kaf Pei Reish Tov. We call it Begit Kaferis, Beis, can base and base, Gimel, where the Yemenite lady is, Gimel and Jimel, and so forth. Each one gets a dot, base, gimel, dalet, kaf, pei, resh, tov. Those seven letters, in time, got created the seven days, and in space, he created a whole bunch of things. Anything <coughs> in space that's the number seven, he created with base, gimel, dalet, kaf, pei, resh, tov. The most basic things, of course, the six directions, and then the number seven is what brings it all together, just like Shabbos brings together the six days of the week. So, Shemayim, the Ebn Shesia, brings in the six directions. That's base, gimel, dalet, kaf, pei, resh, tov. Then comes how many letters are left? The three, we got seven, that's ten. There's 22 letters, there's 12 letters left. Yeah, can you guess what Hashem did with those 12 letters? He created the 12 months. That's in time. In space, he created a whole bunch of things. Uh, one of the things is the 12 tribes, and all of these are hours in time. So let's work this through. Nisan was the letter Hey. How did we get to the letter Hey? Very simple. Aleph was already taken from Aleph Mem Shin, one of the Imahot, one of the Mama letters. Then Beis Gimel Dalet, those are doubles, that's uh, in the seven days of the week. Hey is open for Nisan. Vav is here. You keep on going until you get to the letter Nun, which is the letter of Cheshvan. The letter Nun is the letter of Hashem. For those of you who are really staying with mathematics, I always remind myself, I need a Dodi, the Dodi Li. Okay, Yud Lamed, that is, that is always El and Tishri, and Mem is one of the Mama letters, the Mahos, and then you have Nun. Nun is all you need to know. And for those of you that are completely confused with my ramble for the last three minutes, the bottom line is you need to know that the letter Nun is the letter that corresponds to this month. Who here knows anything about the letter Nun? And I'll give you a clue. Think about Ashrei. Nafal. There we go. Thank you very much. Right? The word Nun means falling. The Nun is missing in Ashrei. Ashrei is Aleph, right? Beis, Gimel, Bochal, Yon, Gadot, etc. The Nun is missing. Why? So the Gemara in Baruchas Abdalad says that the reason why the Nun is missing is because we don't like the letter Nun. Sorry, Nasi, for picking on you today, but Nun means everything that crashes down, everything that falls, everything that seems to be that life is hopeless. There seems to be no direction, what is going on? So that's the letter Nun. Okay, just keep this in the back of your mind, that Kislev is gonna be Sama, because we're gonna to get to Kislev very, very soon. Kislev is the letter Sama. Now, what are we left with? The 12 months, each one of the 12 months has something in the month that teaches us what the month is all about. <clears throat> so I mentioned that Nisan is the month of freedom. How do we know? Let's look at the middle of the month when the moon is at its fullest. And there we see freedom in the air. We look at, for example, the month of Adar. And we see in the middle of the month, laughter is in the air. That permeates throughout the whole month. Every month has an event in history. The rabbis teach us it's a very, very important thing. The Beis HaLevi has a long answer on this. Do not make the mistake to think that since Pesach happened in Nisan, that's why Nisan is the month of freedom. No, it's the other way around. When God created the world, and he created the 12 months, and the 12 months created like the 12 letters, he put into each month a potential. So Nisan was always freedom, and Adar was always laughter, and so on and so forth. You go through the 12 months, and it, it's consistent throughout the whole, the whole year. So it comes out that the letter Nun had an event in history that defines the essence of that month. Does anyone know what I'm referring to? I'll give you a clue. It's Parshas, I don't know, 
No loss. <coughs> Set that. Excellent. Okay, I see my students. Well, there we go. Thank you, Reverend Frank. It's the model. The answer is on Yud Zion, more or less the middle of the month, Shem opened the heavens and the waters came down. When we were in kindergarten, then we found out that Hashem took the open, opened up the higher world and covered the world with water. Why? Because we used to sing this in England. I grew up in England. It was a sad, sad day when Noah built the ark because everybody died. But whatever it's dark British humor, the point is of that song is that that's how we picture it. Wrong. That's not what God did. That is an incorrect way of looking at the flood. It's perfect for, where was I yesterday? Terrace Sanders Preschool, right? It was in the right place. It's perfect for that. But if you want to go a little bit to dance, Hashem took the world and pressed the reset button to day two. Day two, the world was covered with water. Why? Because Mabu comes from the letter base and Lamed. Base and Lamed in the Hebrew language is all the different expressions of to take something back to its original status to obliterate things. So the word base lamed, base lamed, bil bil, or base lamed lamed, or base lamed hey, you have a, a beautiful suit and you let the moss attack it and it's base lamed hey and it becomes a disintegrates. So base lamed symbolizes this month. This is the month of obliteration. So Basi, let's summarize you. You are number one, instant death. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, and thought that number two, everything about you is crashing down. And number three is that whatever was, whatever was healthy, whatever was put together is now obliterated back to zero. So you can't leave until the end of the class because we have to obviously, I want to be able to talk to you again. But the bottom line is, is that what we do get out of this month is that we understand that there's something very known, right? Obviously, I'm a missile, so I identify with the word known. It's very negative and very nephilic. We need to understand this in a proper way. So now comes the centerpiece of my presentation. The next five minutes, I'm going to tell all of the story. The story is not a chazal. The story is not a medrash. The story is not a Rav Nachman story. It comes from my twisted imagination. I made up the story from beginning to end, and it just really, really brings out what Chazal want to say, I think, in a very, very, very real way. And again, for those of you who are trying to understand where is Menachem Nisal going with this, I'm trying to explain that the journey from Tishri to Cheshmer to Kislev is a process, and if you understand this process, you will understand how Hashem runs your world. Every person in this room, without exception, without exception, unless the Kodesh Baruch has given up on you, which he never does, Hashem always keeps us close. So every single one of us goes through these cycles called Tishri, Cheshman, and Kislev. We just have to understand what's going on here behind the scenes. So let's learn this together slowly. Once upon a time, somewhere in South Florida, there was a beautiful, happily married couple that did everything right. The daddy was, um, okay, I'm just gonna use cliches over here, okay? Daddy had a very good job, but whenever he wasn't working, he was either volunteering for whatever it is for various chesed organizations, and he had his chablusas, and, and uh, the stay-at-home mom was, uh, was, was the perfect balas chesed, they always had guests. The, the house was filled with laughter and warmth, and everything about it was beautiful. And they had a daughter, this daughter was, for the purpose of today's class, we'll call her Sweetie Pie. I don't want to give her a name. She's, let's say, eight or nine years old. And she loved her home, and she loved her parents. Her parents gave her a lot of attention. But to be honest, she had a very special place in her heart for her daddy, for her Abba, for her Tati. You know why? Because her father knew what parenting was all about. And by the way, if this was a parenting class, I would say, Listen up now, fathers, because the next two minutes is really a message for every father that's out there. Every Sunday morning, Daddy used to take her out. We used to go to the local park. Daddy used to switch off her phone, excuse me, switch off his phone, and there was a Freudian slip. He used to switch off his phone and, um, and focus on Sweetie Park. We used to go to the park, um, 
play ball, play frisbee. At the end, Danny used to go to the ice cream store, get it, like, you know, as many scoops as he wanted, go and tell mommy. And I don't know, she just felt so warm and so beloved. And so, you know, this is just, Danny used to give her this big hug at the end. And she says, Baruch Hashem, it's so good to be close to my father. And that's how it went on, week in, week out, until one day, Daddy says, Sweetie Pie, I have a surprise for you. I love Daddy's surprises. I think you're ready to learn how to ride a bicycle. Oh, this is so exciting. They go to the bike store. Can't imagine what Manny Beach is a bike store. It just doesn't fit. <laughs> um, but whatever it is, <laughs> no, you don't, right? So they go to the bike store. And um, she, what does she know about bikes? Obviously, she goes with the, with the frills and the buzzers and the things. I remember, I, I can't remember who it was, which one of my daughters it was, buying her a bike. And she, she went, this was um, two of my kids, went through the stage. I can't believe really how much, I want to use that word again. It triggers me to mention this. There's this, I, don't, I have nothing against the Japanese, trust me. I appreciate everything they've given to humanity, except for one thing, which I will never forgive. Is that nasty little cat that has took over the lives of two of my children? Okay, whatever it is, Hello Kitty, you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> I said, it's it. They, they said, that's it. They were going to America, so what do you want? Hello Kitty. Hello Kitty, what? Hello Kitty, everything. <laughs> that's it. You know, like Hello Kitty uh, blankets and Hello Kitty pillows and Hello Kitty writing paper and everything. Hello Kitty, everything had to be Hello Kitty. So, so that's it, okay? I just wanted to literally, if I had to strangle one creature, it would be Hello Kitty. <laughs> um, one of my daughters went through the other one. Um, who's the one with the huge head that just keeps some, like she has some kind of an issue? <laughs> the Explorer, what's her name? Dora. Dora, that was it. <laughs> I used to torment my daughter and tell her that you notice something about Dora the Explorer, she never changes her t-shirt. You know why? <laughs> Because she can't. Because she can't take it off. She just doesn't think about it. So it's like whatever it is. I have I have I have problems of my own. But, um, so of course sweetie pie gets a day with the bells and the bars. Of course it comes with training wheels, but she doesn't really know how to use a bike. Every Sunday morning, Daddy, who's obviously an athlete and healthy, and he is running next to her. Running, 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 and everything is just like Everything is beautiful. She feels so close to her Abba. At the end of her little bicycle session, they go back to get the ice cream. I don't know, everything about ice cream just gives her that sense of good times. Closest to her father, being loved, the flavors, the chocolates, the vanilla, the pistachio. Life is good. One day, Daddy says, today, I have a very special surprise for you. So, Daddy takes the bike, puts it in the back of the, of, the, of the car. Sweetie Pie pops in and Daddy starts to drive. He starts to drive and drive and drive. And suddenly she notices that she's like in, in bad neighborhoods, like really bad neighborhoods. And then Daddy starts climbing higher and higher and the car is going like to the top of this huge hill. I realize this no longer works in South Florida. But let's just keep imagining, okay? We go higher and higher and higher and higher, reaches the top of this like very high hill, and Daddy, with a slightly ominous voice, says, Sweetie Pie, it's time to get out. He jumps out, and she looks over, and she sees, oh my gosh, the road on the other side is basically from a roller coaster. It goes down, she can't even see the bottom. It's like the most frightening thing ever, and it's in a terrible neighborhood, and all the colors around have just gone into various like grays and bleakness. And as she's talking, Daddy is taking off the training wheels. And then suddenly, out of nowhere, Daddy picks her up, puts her in the bike, shoves her down the hill, and says, I still miss the baby. And that's <laughs> it, okay? And before she has a chance to process what's going, she turns around, Daddy has disappeared. And she's going down 10 miles, 20 miles, 30 miles an hour, of course, she's going so fast. And she's looking around, and all these scary looking face, and she's thinking, oh my God, what is going on over here? And then she realizes that she now has two choices. Choice number one is she's gotta take control. She's gotta get on those handlebars. She's gotta focus on what she has in front of her, and she's gonna make sure she comes out of this alive. Choice number two, you don't wanna think about. It. It's basically becoming one 
huge bloody challenge with the asphalt at the bottom of the hill. Sweet fight takes control and she's going down the hill and that's it, okay, and she's focused and she's got this, okay, and she glides the whole thing down and she gets to the bottom of the hill and she gets off and she's one big angry sweetie pie. That's it. She's finished with her father. Her father was a faker at that moment when she needed him most. He abandoned her. And that's it. She looks around and says, okay, I'm no longer a little girl. I see I go. I find myself like a chain gang. That's it. Okay, I'm gonna get myself getting rid of these Bisiaka clothes. I'm gonna get like a leather jacket, some tattoos, as many Christmas as I can. Finish with this whole thing. She is so curious, and then out of nowhere, Daddy appears with like six scoops of ice cream. She looks and says, What do you want? I said, Sweetie Pie. I said, Don't call me Sweetie Pie. Maybe Death Pie. That's it. I'm finished with you, Dad. I'm finished with you, Alba. I'm finished with you, Ty. It's all good. I can't stand this. Is, I can't believe you did this to me. Daddy says, Daddy says, uh, No. Can I, can, I, uh, can I talk? Can I say something? He says, what do you want? He says, did I ever tell you that I own an invisibility cloak? He what? He takes out this, this is my invisibility towel it's over here, right over here. He takes the thing, he opens up, puts it over his head, and disappears. He just disappears. He says, what are you talking about? It's so long. So he says, do you think that for one moment I ever abandoned you? Even for a split second, do you think I abandoned you? So the moment I said that hustle is that I put on that and visit and I was running next to you, I was literally inches away from you. There was not a single moment where you were under, not under my full 100% protection, all the way to the very bottom. And she looks at him and says, his father, I'm calling the authorities on you. Okay, you are so twisted. Okay, this is like, this is, you call this parenting? You're like the sixth person ever. Daddy says, can I explain myself? And she goes, absolutely not. He shoves the ice cream into her hands. At that point then, ice cream, okay. You can talk while I'm eating the ice cream. So Daddy says the following words. I'm asking you now to listen carefully because everyone understands that when I say Daddy, this is a Kurdish Baruch and Sweetie Pie is really you and I all the time. Knesset Yisrael, Klai Yisrael, every single one of us, without exceptions, goes through what I'm about to say to you. Daddy says, what did I create you for? Do you really think I wanted to be Sweetie Pie your whole life? Do you really think I wanted to be the recipient of more sweetness and more goodness and everything that, like the festival of Sukkot, which Rapinka's calls Hashem's hug, right? It's really you know, the thing that they do with a hug. Do you really want to be treated with hugs and kisses? That's not why I brought you into this world. I am looking for a partner. I am looking for a partner. I am looking for someone that can take this world with sucking all in the mouth of Shaka to fix up the world in partnership with me. I need someone who's equal to me. As we say in Shira Shurim, Yonasi, Tamasi, Tumasi, my twin. A twin is an equal, just like in a marriage. A real marriage is not, you know, a daddy, the husband is rich and the husband is powerful and, and you sit at home and just spend, you know, from morning to night doing your nails and going to, I don't know, Zumba and then coming back and, and getting, going shopping and then you have all the umkalumpas in your house cleaning everything. That's not a marriage. That's not a healthy marriage. A healthy marriage is two equal people, 100% equal on every single level, and they're bringing out a thing called a Jewish home. And for the universe, which is Hashem's bias, He has Kali Yisrael, Knesset Yisrael, and we are His partner. So Hashem says, I need a partner. So the first month when we got the relationship down was the month of Tishri. So everything was one direction. By the end of the month, I had nothing, absolutely nothing that I could rely on you to see whether you could be my partner. So for one month, I abandoned you. For one month, I forced you 
to discover absolutely everything on your own. You had to figure out, you had two choices. You could either abandon the whole destiny of what you're brought down to this world for. You could put your head into a hole and disappear. You could run away from your own shadow. Or you can look into yourself and find inner strength that you never knew you had. You can discover yourself for the first time. You can get to know that person in the mirror that you've looked at externally throughout your life and see the internal all the way deep, deep, deep down until you realize that you have a strength inside of you that is infinite, that is godlike, because you have a neshama. And with that neshama, you're literally, literally infinite. But the story does not end there because there has to be a moment in time when God re-reveals himself takes off his invisibility clothes and says, now I want to show you something. And of course, this is going to be the month of Kislev, but I'm going to have to explain myself properly. Now I want to show you something. I want to show you that during that time when you felt abandoned, everything, absolutely everything was an illusion. Quick question. The letter Nun was the letter Hashem. What was the letter of Kislev? Anyone remember? Sama. Where is the Samach in Ashrei? What does the Pasuk say? Somech Hashem l'chal hanoflein. Says the Gemara in Brachas of Dalit. That's when we find out what the Nun was all about. That's the letter Nun reappearing once again. But that's when we find out that Kishon Baruch the letter Samach had not really disappeared. It was there all along. I want to read to you the Tzad of Koen. He brings the Pasuk. Ki Hashem, it's a Pasuk in, in Mishlei. It says, Ki Hashem yeh v'kislecha v'shama rabacha mokayit. Hashem will be your support system. He will catch you from falling. So that's the month of Kislev. But here it's a little bit tricky. Because remember I told you that the month of Kislev, it's really not Hanukkah until the very end. You know why? Because that moment, when Daddy revealed himself, remember in my story there was tension? There was tension. She had to be explained. She had to reconcile. So, Mr. Psalter and the Mace Hoss explained the letter Samach is a very, very tricky letter. The letter Samach can belong to the Sun. It's a wheel. It's a wheel that goes round and round. The letter Samach can be that feeling that you are just treading. Like a like a, like a like a rat on a treadmill, on a on a, on, a, on what you call again the yeah, exactly yeah. The point is is that when we say this in English, I feel like I'm spinning my wheels. That's the letter sama. The letter sama can be something where you just you feel directionless, or you can go a little deeper and see sayu Hashem That's because we chose to find it. My Rebbe Moshe told us that the month of Cheshman is not the month of Hanukkah. Excuse me, the month of Kislev is not the month of Hanukkah. It's the month of the battles that preceded Hanukkah. Those battles happen in this month, battles between the Hashanayim and the, and the powerful Greek Empire. Al HaNisim, Ve'al HaKorkom, Ve'al HaTshibar Gvuz, Ve'al HaTshuz, Ve'al HaMilchamas. We thank Hashem for the Muhammad's, the wars are the wars of discovering that all along it was a Kurdish Baruch. The Hanukkah story is the journey to discovering that the light of Hanukkah, the miracle of the eight days, which by the way is not a huge miracle, every Hasidic Shereva worth his salt can do that trick, make the light last for eight days, that's no big deal. That's no big deal. But it showed us that during those battles, when you were fighting the Greeks, Hashem was holding your hands all along. He never once abandoned you. The month of Kislev are the wars, the inner battles of self-discovery to realize that Cheshvan was an illusion. Sayyidina Hashem al-Khala Naitim, HaKadosh Baruch was there for you all along. And now I come to our lives. Because our lives, HaKadosh Baruch Hu designs it purposely that you must go through moments of abandonment 
we must make a choice. And Mashiach comes, if Mashiach says to me, listen, I, I have so many people to talk to you, but only when I'm I have time for one question. I'm going to be asking about mental health. It's the one thing that I, I struggle with understanding. Baruch Hashem, Baruch Hashem, that my people I'm close to, close to, I are in a good place. The people that I love, my students, and, 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 and just outside of my, my family, and I see their suffering, I don't know what a Kashbar wants this period of history. I don't know what it means when I read the statistics of what's going on in the schools today, and I hear from my friends that are working in high schools about the mental health issues and the crisis that people go through and how many people are going to therapy and don't say no, they're just discovering it now. No, yeah, because they need it, because the anxiety and that, that feeling of being insecure. But there's no question in my mind that at that moment then, when they say, where's a Kurdish Baruch in this? There are thousands of young men and women today who are struggling with the Muhammad of the month of Islam. And at the end, at the end, there's always, always guaranteed the light of Hanukkah. That little moment where you suddenly see a Kush Baruch was there for you all along. How beautiful is the words of the Bnei Yisraskar that says, this is the first three psukim of the Torah. This is the olive base of the Torah. The Torah begins this way. Tishrei, Beresh, Yisbarah, Lekim, Tishmaim, Yisarit. That's the perfect world. That's where everything is falling into place. What's the second passage? Everything's gone. Everything's crashing. Everything's falling apart. And then, what's the third passage of the Torah? Let there be light. So people think it's the light of Hanukkah. How beautiful is that? No. It's the light of Kislev that climaxes with Hanukkah that sheds light on the month of Cheshvan and say, do you think for one moment Hashem abandoned you? No, the whole thing was an illusion. It never happened. Because Baruch Hu was there for you all along, but he wanted you to discover him because he wanted you to become you. He doesn't want sweetie pies. He doesn't want the spoiled grass to just give and get and get and get. He wants someone that can earn partnership with the Kodesh Baruch Hu so that at the end, you get something that is forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. What we get at the end, which is a relationship with Hashem, is a relationship that never ends. So you have 120 years in this world, all of us there, 6,000 years, that does not begin to 6,000 gazillion years, and I don't even know what a gazillion is, but it's a lot of gazillions. It's forever and ever. And any person in this room that has experienced a moment of true inner joy, true inner happiness, that is the first second of all of That's that first second, that first second, and it gets better and better and better till infinity, because Hashem is infinite. But all he needs is the second of all of the He needs someone to say, I choose God. I'm not giving up on him. I'm not giving up and believing that there's a reason for the way I feel and the reason for why I'm going through what I'm going through. And at some point, that spark called the light of Hanukkah is going to show what a Kaddish Baruch Hu wanted from you all along. But a Kaddish Baruch Hu wants people like us to be strong on the inside. And we have to struggle and have Muhammad to find that strength. And that's the only way to get there. It says of Sarah Kakona would win. Comes out the Cheshvan, and I dedicate the next minute to, to Basi over here. Akra, look at the word Akra. Ayin, Kuf, Resh, make a break and then base. Ayin, Kuf, Resh, base. Ikar, base. The main month of the Jewish calendar is a lowly, bitter Cheshvan. You know why? Because that's when you make the most important discovery of all. You find that person that's called you, the real potential that's inside of you. How beautiful it is that Rapsara points out that Cheshvan, which is Gematria 358, is exactly the Gematria of Mashiach and Gabi. Mashiach is, three, excuse me, 372, 358 plus 14. What does it mean, Mashiach and Gabi? Meaning, we want the Gerua 
we want to find the rule it's going through that month of Cheshvan. The Medrash called the Psikta Rabba brings down that the first base of Migdash was dedicated in Tishri, but that's Psukim, the Shonach. The second one was in Kislev. The main part of the dedication was in Kislev. The Medrash says, the Cheshvan started crying, you left me out. I feel abandoned. It's not fair. What do you want from me? You went from Tishri to Chet to Kislev. Why are you ignoring me? And Kosh Baruch says, you Cheshvan, I'm holding off because I need you for the third base of Mikdash, which is forever and ever. That's where you come in. Your story is at the end of days. So I want to go back to that moment when I thought I wasn't going to get on that plane. I, I, I was sure I wouldn't get on that plane. And, 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 and my wife did not give up. She said that to Helen. And here I am standing today. And what can I tell you? I'm not a, I'm not a Rebbe, I'm not even close to being Rebbe, but I did come yesterday from Yerushalayim from Kiddush. I give you the bracha for those of you who are struggling with parenting, and struggling with marriages, and struggling with parnasa, and struggling with all the things that are called normal, regular life. This Kislev, we should be able to see light and see that all the struggles had a light at the end of the tunnel. But more importantly, the way I started this class, is that for goodness sake, and say, ah, oh, Yishbaruch, we'll take away Corona, uh, bring back Trump, whatever that's supposed to mean, I don't fully get it. But bring that back, bring back the good days, the way it was before, chas v'shon, we should say that. God, they were never good. Those times were never good. Akash Baruch is ranking up the crazy because he wants that this time when we light the Hanukkah candle, there should be a different experience. And I want to say one last thing. All 12 months of the year, every single yontah that we've gone through, Pesach and Shulis, and especially we just went through Russia, I had Corona during Simchas Torah. It's being at home, you're not tasting the experience of the yontah, being at home. You gotta go to Shul, you got its communities, the whole thing. The one yontah where you can have the complete experience without leaving your house is Kul Hanukkah. This Hanukkah, we light our candles, Ner Ish Ubeso, the Jewish home. We should tell our Kurdish Baruch, this Hanukkah, the Ezra Shem Baruch, that little light, your little light, my little light, all of the light should come together and bring that the Yayma Hashem Yehi on, the Irish and Mashiach, we should be Zohar to see it this year. That's the normal that we want, the hair of the Omeyu Omeyu. Thank you so much for listening.